So today we are discussing the Dignity Doctrine, uh, Rational Relations in an Irrational World, written by Mark Coleman, who is here with us today. And we will be asking some questions. Let me go to full screen mode here. Sometimes it just goes black for a little bit. Okay, so this is part of our monthly book club, and it's the High Impact Reading Challenge. The two challenges are that you read the books, and secondly, that you come to these calls, whether you've read the book or not. This month is a little bit um, light on our on our viewers, but everyone is out doing stuff and enjoying the weather, and uh, so we're going to have an intimate conversation here with Mark. So today's book discussion, like I said, is The Dignity Doctrine. So Mark, we are super glad to have you here today. I'm delighted to be here, Laura. Thank you so much. I and I, I can't thank you enough for, um, you know, suggesting that the Dignity Doctrine be part of the book club in in your reading and review. Uh, so I really look forward to our conversation. Awesome. So we'll do quick introductions, and then we will um, skip our usual round robin, and we'll go into just asking Mark some questions about the book. And then we can open it up to any other comments that anyone has. And then we'll talk about briefly about next month's book. We are recording, so just watch your P's and Q's. Everyone is entitled to their own opinions. And we know that Mark has some strong opinions in this book, but <laughs> we'll learn more about them. And we want everyone to have fun. So the High Impact Reading Challenge is part of an effort, a greater effort we have to get high impact leadership persons reading a lot of books. Um, you can join as a member totally for free. You can join as a supporter to help us pay for our administrative costs. And you can join as a sponsor so that we can do more fun things and put funds into Literacy Project and a First Time Readers Fund. These are our current sponsors and our supporters. So we'd definitely like to thank Tani Eastman, Robin McKinney, Jody Hatch, Barb Stone, Lisa Sears, and Jerry Nolan for their support and sponsorship of the book club. So here's how our numbers are shaking out. We're not quite yet meeting our goal. Um, our administrative costs are about $300 a month. So we're looking to get enough supporters and sponsors to fill that and any extra funds will go into our literacy projects. We also have our, through our book lists, affiliate funds that will also go towards that. And our next month's book is Leading Quietly by Joseph Badaracco. <laughs> and that will be Thursday, July 29th, also at noon on Thursday. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and start off the introductions. I'm Laura Thorne. I'm a business consultant, career coach, photographer, and other things uh, located here in Syracuse. And um, just really looking forward to today's discussion. I'll hand it over to my partner in the book club, Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Sears. Um, I am a capacity consultant and coach. Um, I I travel between Asheville, North Carolina and upstate New York. So I feel pretty lucky that I get to have be with my family in Syracuse and also my new family in North Carolina and just enjoy some winter weather that makes more sense for where I'm at. <laughs> in life. So uh, really enjoying the book club with with Laura and all of you. So thanks. Oh, Kim. I'll pass it to you, Kim. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kim Tapley. I am in sunny Florida, near Tampa. I am in the environmental regulatory field. So I work at an agency that has multiple divisions where we regulate environmental impacts, complaint investigation, review proposed development plans, that sort of thing. So a lot of what was discussed in this book is what I live every day. So it was interesting to see it in book form from another person's perspective that is not in the regulatory environmental field. And I'll hand it over to Nicole. Hi, I'm Nicole Simmons. I live in Syracuse, New York. So Mark, I'll probably see you at the grocery store or something. <laughs> uh, nice although right now I'm in Georgia, thankfully, um, because it's beautiful here. Um, I am the owner of Relationship Matters LLC, and I teach, train, and mentor people in the Nurtured Heart Approach, which is a relationship-focused um, way of creating um, and sustaining loving 
relationships with other people, whether it's the people closest to you or whether it's the cashier at Walmart. Um, so that's, that's what I do. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Nicole. It's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, I, I love the work that you do. I'd like to delve into that as we get talking about the book a little bit, as well as uh, Kim and, and Lisa and, and Laura's questions as well. That's terrific. Thanks, Mark. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you all again for uh, entertaining the Dignity Doctrine as one of your book choices. Uh, there's so many incredible books out there. And I really feel grateful that you guys have chosen this book uh, in particular. Um, for those of you that did have the opportunity to read it, I hope that you found, um, you know, some ounce of, uh, you know, purpose and wisdom in there. Um, you know, I come from a place where, you know, writing is a joy, um, but it's also very difficult to uh, put your your thoughts out to the world sometimes. Um, and we'll get, we can get more into that in just a moment. Um, but per the book, as you all know, I'm a writer, I'm an author, uh, I'm also a speaker. Um, I work uh, also in academia where I teach uh, at Syracuse University in the Whitman School of Management, both undergraduate and graduate level courses in sustainable enterprise. Um, but my day job has been focused in the energy and sustainability field for most of my career. Um, so currently I work uh, as a director of advanced energy advisory and innovation for a company called TRC. I'm happy to tell you all about that. Um, but I've also had my own management consultancy and have done my own work uh, for a long time, you know, in this space, this nexus between technology, innovation, sustainability, environmental uh, affairs, and, and really trying to improve the uh, the state of affairs and, and, and the condition of the world uh, and how it supports all of us, you know, in humanity in, in many ways. Um, so that's where I stem from in terms of just my uh, background and um, uh, interests. I do have, uh, as we we're getting to know each other just before recording here, uh, I do have two boys, uh, ages 11 uh, and 13, and, um, you know, and reside here in the uh, Syracuse region. Um, so. So thank you all, it's a welcome. And Lisa, I have an aunt who lives uh, in Asheville, um, you know, just beautiful part of the country. So glad to hear that you're, you know, floating back and forth between there. Kim, just to pick up on something that you had referenced, um, in my book promotion for the Dignity Doctrine, I, and, and Laura, I should say, I've been lazy about it, but I haven't been that lazy. I have done some things and it has gotten some interesting response. So. As an example, I sent the book to uh, the administrator of the EPA, uh, and he sent back a very nice form letter um, acknowledging receipt of the book, but also picking up on a couple of the themes uh, from within the book, and uh, definitely appreciate that. So the work that you're doing in environmental regulatory affairs is so critical, and uh, just so much opportunity there. And, um, and Nicole, the work that you're doing, I'd love to hear more about, because this beating heart of, you know, um, treating people with dignity, respect, uh, coming from a place that's heartfelt and using that as a motivation to empower people and empower mm -hmm. the condition of our leadership of the day, particularly during these, you know, what I would term turbulent times that we've seen, not just in the past 16 months, but really before COVID and before that, we were still seeing the, the, the uptick in, in some turbulence within society in many different ways. And I think what we've seen in the past 16 months is really a um, a capstone, if you will, to to all of that, uh, where we it's been top of mind, uh, right in front of our faces, a felt experience uh, in, a, in a very uh, significant way for most people. And, and I think that's because obviously we've all been in a condition where we've had to, uh, you know, be sequestered and, and view life from a different lens and a different point of view. Uh, and for many of us, that's resulted in us being more aware of the world and our surroundings. And in many cases, it's revealed uh, injustices and challenges that have always been there. Um, I phrase that this way and kind of and kind of connect the dots between us because, in essence, I wrote this book as a as an opportunity to share some of those thoughts, hopefully with a sense of um, humility, and do just what we're doing here today: evoke more conversation, evoke more uh, inspired thought and wisdom around uh, how we treat each other, how the world is manifesting um, a better state of being or continuing to you know, uh, push forward the can down the road, so to speak, and, and, 
and continued behaviors of the past that may be negative and hurtful to uh, to each other and, and to the earth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let me pause there because because I know Laura knows me well, and uh, I will consume time by talking too much if allowed. So I'll cut myself off. <laughs> oh, you're in you're in good company with that. <laughs> I was just gonna say I think you all can tell why I wanted to invite Mark to be part of the book club and and come here to interview because he's just wonderful. To, it's it's really nice to find someone who's a good conversationalist, and um, his topics just intercede with what all of the work that we are all doing and. Um, so anyway, I think that um, we can just go around and see who has questions or comments at, about the book. Does anybody want to kick something off? I wanted to ask, how long did it take you to write the book? So I could definitely tell it's a very thoughtful book and, and it just seems like it, it's a labor of love is what I got from the book. I really appreciate that, Kim. Um, this was my third book, as you may know. Um, I wrote my first book in 2012, The Sustainability Generation, a second book in 2014, not intending to write a book two years after the first book called Time to Trust, and then this book that came out last year. And I do feel like this um, was a labor of love differently than the first two titles. Um, I've never felt, and I should back up just a moment, when I published my first book in 2012, I had always had a strong interest in 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 books and in publishing. I had worked, um, I would call almost as an understudy uh, to a mentor and consultant early in my career that had published books. Um, and I learned a little bit, of, not only about the craft and art of writing books, but also about the publishing industry. And, it also, and then it engaged me to do some work behind book research, uh, some book writing, uh, where I could, had contributed to a couple chapters of this gentleman's published titles, um, and also had started my own blog you know, pre-2008, you know, um, when they weren't really as in vogue uh, to a certain extent as they even are today, um, in support of publishing his books. And I, and I had it in the back of my mind, like, why am I doing this? I really enjoy this, but I should do this for myself. And I thought, well, when I have more life experience and I have something to say, um, you know, perhaps down the road, uh, maybe even in retirement or something like that, I can reflect on career and life and, and write books. And that was always in the back of my mind. But 2012 was a time uh, right after my first son was born and lots of different uh, topics that I actually captured in this third book, uh, The Dignity Doctrine, with more heart and passion uh, than I did the first book on a very individual or personal basis. And um, it provided the mechanism, I think, for me to bring a title forward in 20, 2012 that I, I, I didn't know or think that I would. So that was my first entree. I just give that backstory because um, as I got into time to trust, there was a different motivation during that time. And this dissolution of trust that was going on in society that felt like a very personal uh, conviction I wanted to bring forward and, and have a point of view on. Um, but this one, to your point, Kim, was very much different. Um, it took me, I, I'd have to go back in my mind, it took probably a couple of years. Um, and part of it for me is I, I've never gone into book writing, and maybe I should, as the deliberate na nature of writing a book. You know, some authors may approach it as, here's conceptually what I want to accomplish, here's a table of contents, or, you know, where, where I'd like to, um, you know, uh, write specific sections. Um, I began this one a little bit different. Um, it was more of a, I had published some articles, I had published some pieces, I was doing some speaking, I was doing some, you know, consultative work, and I began doing some extracurricular writing uh, where my mind and spirit wanted to um, explore some specific topics, and I found myself going deeper and deeper, and having two titles behind me, I realized quickly this might be another book that's starting to emerge. So. At that point, I did start to put some structure to it and some purpose to it, um, and and eventually, about two years into the process, uh, realized there was a book. On this one, uh, just to kind of close out that that question with you, um, I did go back to my original publisher. So the first publisher I had was a company by the name of Select Books out of New York City. Um, I thought they did just a, such a terrific job on the first title. I actually didn't shop this title around too much. I went back to my original publisher and said, look, I think I have a really interesting book here. 
um, it's sticking in the theme and topic that you know of me as an author. Um, I'd love to take it, you know, a little bit deeper than I did in the first book uh, on an individual basis. So it's, it'll be fundamentally a different kind of read. Um, but they were excited and they said, this is a, this is an exciting uh, project and, and why don't we get behind it? So um, that, that helped it uh, spring forward and, and cross the finish line as a published title. Can I jump I just in, know when the book was. Huh? <laughs> I said, can I jump in? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, I mean, from, I think a lot of the people in this group, part of why they do the sponsorship is they, they either themselves have wanted to write a book or know somebody who's wanted to write a book or just have a love for books. And I think that's the commonality in our group. Um, and a little bit of what Laura and I have, you know, the want for passion around encouraging other people to write books. So it's, super exciting when we get to actually be with someone that's like local and wrote something and you've gotten some really great accolades from your first two books. And so it's, it's exciting for us. And I think much like Kim, I'm like, so curious about the process and things like that. And we read a book called uh, Big Magic earlier this year. And it, it really encouraged, encouraged people, even if they felt like somebody had already told that story to really just tell it in the way that it, that helps you you process that story and have it be good enough and have it be for that particular audience that is actually drawn to you. So there's been a lot of themes of kind of just putting yourself out there and, and that can be really scary for people. So did, you know, first book, like, is it hard to get over that? Like, just, I'm going to, I'm going to put this out there and it's good enough. And like, what is that? Do you, did you experience a lot of that kind of? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, absolutely. I think so in, in all my books, there's a certain amount of personal antidote, whether it comes from my personal life or business and professional life. And both sides of those for me are equally uncomfortable because on one hand you're shaping to a certain extent, people's, um, knowledge and awareness of you. Um, you're maybe mm -hmm. providing greater context or color to what that may be. So what people think or know of you may also fundamentally change uh, by virtue of what you're putting out to the world. Um, and there's a certain amount of, you know, independent thinking that you're also bringing forward that some people may agree with and may not, right? So there's, for me as an author, I think there's um, a lot of discomfort. I often say it to my wife, like, you know, the book's out, I have to go into hiding now for a month because, <laughs> you know, not that a lot of people are picking it up and reading it and saying, what was he thinking, you know, or I never knew this about, about Mark. Um, it, it's just more the, I think there's a, you're revealing a sense of your spirit and personality. At the same time, though, uh, to your point uh, in question, Lisa, uh, there's a real release in all that as well, almost, and it's an uplifting uh, sense of, acknowledgement that if you're speaking coming from a point of that true self identity, that inner wisdom that we all have, that notion of truth that we all carry with us, and you're speaking from that place of, of intellect and, and heart, um, none of us should be afraid as a point of view of putting that out to the world in whatever other, other medium uh, it exists in. There, there's a small, um, I forget if it's in the introduction or towards the tail end of the book, um, I talk about the mediums of self-expression that we all have um, and whether that's art or music uh, or writing books or public speaking or just being silly with our friends and family, just letting our personality and our spirit shine. Uh, to me, that gets back to the heart of us acknowledging each other for who we are and for all our faults, for all our greatness, for all our inspired glory, if you will. And relishing in the fact that that diversity that we all bring to the world should be celebrated. And so, yes, we may all experience different aspects of life or, or certain situations, but we're all coming at it from a, a very different point of view often based upon, you know, who we are, our upbringing, what we think, or, you know, we experience during that situation, et cetera. And so in, in that way, I believe we all have a very unique and distinct voice that can and should be shared with the world uh, as a point of view. And this just happens to be a medium of self-expression that um, not only am I comfortable with, um, but I'm also continuing to grow and, and learn with. Um, I know through each of the three books, 
Um, I know my personal weaknesses, and I know areas of strengths, um, but I look at it as a journey where if I continue this um, evolution as a writer, um, I know where I need to improve and look at it as an opportunity to do so in, in, in each instance. And whether that's a book or whether that's an essay or whether that's a, a press release that I've written for a client, you know, so um, I'm always looking for that opportunity to grow. But, but I definitely encourage anyone. I think the love of books, the expression of the human condition, um, the ability to bring forward your own story and your own narrative in whatever shape you'd like to bring that in uh, is, uh, is a tremendous opportunity for all of us. Um, so certainly happy to um, offer wisdom, guidance, anything that I know in support of anybody who would like to go down this path um, locally or beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I always say I kind of have two drafts of a book in my head, right? The one that I can publish now and then the one I have to wait for a couple of people to pass away. <laughs> I have, I have that book too. <laughs> people I love, right? But some of your wisdom comes from those experiences and you're like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's funny. Well, Nicole, did you have any questions you want to ask? Oh, I don't. I can't think of any questions right now, but I, I did just want to thank you for, for sharing this of you because that's such a vulnerable thing to do. And it's not just sharing in a conversation like this, it's sharing in a book that, you know, you've put out there for everybody. Um, and I just, I really appreciate your bravery and your, um, just your willingness to share, you know, this, the personal stories about your wife and your and your sons and that those pieces spoke the most to me um, because one of the things I value in myself is my ability to connect with people. And so when I, you know, when you watch the, like the cooking shows and they do the backstory, my husband hates the backstory. He thinks it's like a waste of time. And I, that's my favorite part. I'm like, tell me the backstory. I wanna know who these people are. Um, so I appreciate it. I appreciated you including those pieces in the book because you certainly didn't have to. You could have still written that book and left those personal pieces out, but you including them just shows, you know, your your courage and your um, willingness to connect connect with people in, in a bigger way. And I appreciate that. Thank okay. you very much, Nicole. That yeah. that um, that makes me uncomfortable, <laughs> but but in a very good way. No, no, I don't mean it like that. It's because sure. I, I really truly appreciate your words. And I, and I think there's, I'll say to a certain extent, I've had this conversation with other authors too. There can be a certain selfishness to writing. Um, and I think for me, part of this process has been a certain amount of healing, right? So when I think of my wife and my son, and certainly as you read the book, you know, what they've experienced health wise and other and otherwise, um, you know, they're not alone. You know, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of people that have, you know, conditions uh, like they do and autoimmune disease that people struggle with it and, and, and things that are much more challenging in many ways. And people have gone through much, much more. So I'm super aware of that and super hypersensitive to it to the point where my story and my family's journey is not singular. Um, but at the same time, I wanted to put it out to the world uh, in, in recognition that people are going through challenging th things. And oftentimes, um, there's so many anecdotes on this that I could, I could go down. Um, you know, the one that I'll pick on is, you know, whether we're in the workplace or we're talking amongst friends, or sometimes you see that driver that passes you and, you know, they look like an erratic driver and you, you know, want to, you know, curse them and say bad things. Um, sometimes our point of view is warranted, uh, but sometimes we just don't know what's going on in people's lives, right? So this idea of judgment and putting, um, you know, uh, perceptions on people uh, to deflect from our own situations, you know, bringing greater awareness and mindfulness to that, I think is just so necessary in the times that we're living in because so many people, particularly this past year, are going through so many things that we just may not be able to fully understand. You know, in, in our life experience and what we've done is very much different than our neighbors, our sisters, our brothers. Um, and so just that ounce of understanding and uh, validating other people's existence at a certain level, I think is just, uh, you know, part, part of that process and, and part of that dignified existence that I think we all seek. 
And so I really appreciate your words because I think part of my my thoughts in bringing these stories for stories forward is to reflect. Uh, I think it's helped me in a sense understand uh, those moments of life uh, that can be very immersed in a lot of challenge um, can also be brought forward with a, a great sense of beauty and opportunity going forward. Um, and the more we learn from other people's situations and the human condition, the more that we can also be prepared for when those moments may come into our life. Mm. And, and any of us that are lucky enough to live a long and healthy life are luckily are likely to come into some sense of, of uh, situation where we, we need help or we need assistance or we need the mental uh, uh, rigor to be able to uh, work our way through it. And I think in the in the act of learning from others, we can certainly be prepared a little bit more, um, and and certainly seek out, um, you know, that 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 understanding from from others' experiences. Thanks. Um, that kind of leads me to another question that I had. Um, when you wrote the book, were you did you have in mind like what effect or what would you hope for readers to, to really take away or to change after they've read your book? That's a great question also, Laura. I think um, I, I've i written, so now in my third book, and have, having had been on the speaking circuit, you know, particularly with the first two books more than I have on this book, uh, just due to some of what's gone on the past year, um, I've realized that a lot of people pick up on different things in the book that sits with them. And I've really appreciated that. So even though I've gone in with a specific theme or a specific message that I'm trying to convey, I realize, like Nicole's, you know, reference here to the personal side of the story, you know, wanting to, you know, build back through the characters of the story, even though they're real people, but the characters and understand, you know, where's Mark coming from? You know, how is this story highly relevant to this topic of dignity that he's talking about and bringing forward? Um, I appreciate that in so many levels because I find that often there's these antidotes that um, uh, I didn't intend to be um, more pervasive in terms of the impact it had on readers, um, but those are the ones that end up being the nuggets that people hold on to. Um, so, so I think that's just a fascinating thing about the art of um, writing and, and the messages that get conveyed. To succinctly answer your question, um, it would be... I come back to this place where I didn't intend this in sequence around the three books. You know, the first book was very much about accountability and personal accountability in the context of the global world that we live in and how I think at a certain level, most of humanity is looking for a more peaceful, just and sustainable world. And that we all have a underlying opportunity, if not responsibility, to be accountable to our own personal lives, as well as to the institutions and the livelihoods that we serve. Um, so accountability was that first book in many ways. You know, the second book was was fundamentally trust. Um, it was witnessing if I had to peel back accountability and look at why aren't we having or manifesting a more sustainable world at scale. Um, for me, between 2012 and 2014, it came back to this idea that there was this dissolution of trust, and I actually saw that then, as a personal point of view, amplify between 2014 and the past year. Um, that's for a lot of diverse reasons. Um, but, you know, if we don't have trust in ourselves, in our institutions, in each other, you know, there's a certain fundamental breaking down of what's helped build up humanity to be cohesive to a certain extent to where we are today. Um, and then with this third book, it was this notion of a grounding in human behavior and human understanding around dignity. So if we lose, if we don't have accountability to oneself if, and our neighbors, if we don't have uh, the trust uh, in ourselves and our families and our institutions and know how to maintain a healthy trust-based relationship. And then if we ultimately uh, fumble at the fate of humanity by not allowing dignity to be a part of that equation in terms of how we're treating each other and ourselves, um, we're really beginning to break down as a society, uh, which I, I hope is not the case. Um, 
one of the things I get not one, but um, a point of view of how I think about this of what's happening right now. Um, I thought it in preparation for this call. It may or may not work, so forgive me in advance. Uh, but but society has gone mad, and if I if I think about the acronym there just for a moment, we're witnessing a great migration of people and plants, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in a moment. A great adaptation um, and a great division. So migration, you know, whether it's due to political or geopolitical concerns or climate change, we're seeing people on borders, near borders, wanting to find better, better hope, better promise for a future uh, from an economic equity perspective uh, and, and other concerns. Uh, we're also seeing migration in the past year just due to COVID. So people moving from urban centers into more rural centers, people wanting to be closer to home. So, you know, the global pandemic has put uh, mobility uh, towards humanity in a way that we haven't seen at a scale in a long time. You know, people want to find safety and comfort and livelihoods where perhaps during a pandemic-like environment, uh, we didn't feel like we had that safety net uh, over us. Um, adaptation, you know, whether it's climate change uh, related or adaptation to all that's gone on during the COVID era uh, or the focus that we see now with businesses and institutions wanting to reopen, reopen better, improve upon the fate of uh, their future uh, with, with better operating systems, better practices. Um, we're seeing that adaptation is something that's part of our narrative in our lifetime at a very significant scale. And we could, I don't like the word division um, in this context, but I, but I bring it forward. We can think about it as a, a divisive uh, culture that we're living in in many ways. Um, you know, the cancel culture, the the idea that people just want their opinion to be the only opinion that's heard. And there's been a certain uh, uh, placation uh, to that, you know, uh, driven by, you know, our, the social media, uh, our political figures, our business figures, uh, other, other notable people. And I think all that adds up to this notion that we've, we've, we've gone bad, um, but there's, but, but the common threads through that um, you know, not to oversimplify it, but the common threads of what makes humanity hold together, accountability, trust, dignity, getting back to that moral conviction, that moral stance that we all have as an inner wisdom, we really don't want to do harm in society. We don't really want to do harm to ourselves. Um, and we're now kind of, not kind of, I believe we're recalibrating our understanding of how we work together, play together, live together, and bring forward the wisdom we've always had so that we can have a more peaceful, just, and sustainable world um, as a point of view. And so I think it's interesting that during this time right now, we are all witnessing some very dramatic shifts in society, in business, in religion, uh, in spirituality, in uh, health and wellness, and in, in all sectors. And I think it's it's challenging us, and I think it's uh, requiring us to think differently about our future. I think it's drawing into question some of our education and training and, and where we come from, our, our fundamental beliefs and, and values. Um, but I hope that if we can keep ourselves together in a dignified way, we can come on the back of that as a better, more informed, more inclusive society that celebrates all that which makes it diverse and with that actually brings forward um, an image of, 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 of a, not just an economy, but a world and a society uh, that, is, that is more kind uh, and that looks at happiness and hope and joy as aspirational things that can be accomplished, uh, not things that should be pitting us against each other or keeping us at odds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to have that hope when you see so many things. It is. It really is. And I, and I, I, I believe, Lisa, that we are starved. And, I and thank you, by the way, for that question, because I believe that we are starved for authentic, trusted leadership mm -hmm. and talent um, at all levels and at all institutions oh. um, to really help us here. So, so that's where I think the work that you all are doing in your individual careers and lives, the efforts, uh, Laura and, and Lisa, bringing the, the, the book club together, these are things, these are conversations, again, that excite me. Um, the, the notion of just publishing books for publishing sake or anything else is, you know, 
that way I do this. It's really about how can we learn from one another, bring forward these messages, take those messages, drive them into action, take those actions, really drive them into behavioral modifications and opportunities for us to um, better our lives, better the lives of our, those that we love, and and hopefully lead a um, you know uh, a greater existence as humanity. Um, as silly as that may sound, I hope it doesn't sound silly. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You brought up um, that your first book around accountability. I was in my like 30s, had finally gotten to like that management group, and we were all tasked with different groups to present in our, during a leadership meeting. And my group was about how do we create a culture of accountability. Yeah. And I was literally the only one that showed up for the meetings. <laughs> and. <laughs> And, you know, when you're in your 30s, you think you can, you, you don't quite have professionalism down. So my presentation was two, uh, two statements, hold yourself accountable. And underneath it said they might actually follow our lead. <laughs> and that right. was it. Like probably pretty inappropriate, uh, you know, a new young leader. <laughs> I laugh yeah. at myself some of the things. I used to do. No. And, and, you know, these these are things you know we can call them soft skills that are actually now become hard skills and and i say that because so many businesses i hear this from a diversity of sources as well as my own personal life and professional uh, life but these are things that we need both right we need the stem education but we also need these skills that are teaching about accountability responsibility um you know dignity um you know, and, and sometimes that permeates or carries through certain um, structures and, uh, but there's, it's been waning too, right? Family structures in America and, and the world have been shifting. Spiritual uh, and religious structures have been shifting. The foundations or what we consider that foundations or institutions in many ways have fundamentally changed in the past 10 or 20 years. So I believe we're now in search of a new, or or if not new, a, a, a common ground of understanding that we can get back to, I call it get back to basics because we all understand these things. Um, but we also see that there's a lot to be gained by, to your point, about more people taking action. Um, I'll give you a quick, really quick story. Um, Laura may have heard this one from me before, but um, when my father-in-law was alive, you know, he was a, 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 he, you know, he was a public servant his entire life. Um, but he also in, later in life got into politics and was successful at a local level, you know, uh, being on a city council for 16 or so years. Um, I often found great joy, you know, Saturday or Sunday mornings, you know, going on his front porch, having, uh, you know, a lemonade or a coffee or whatever your favorite libation and kind of just having conversation about the politics of the day, you know, and, you know, you're kind of doing the blue sky thing, like, well, what if this, you know, what if that, and, you know, it's in those moments, and I think we've all had them, you know, with family or friends, you know, husbands or wives or, you know, whomever, where our true personal convictions sometimes come out and we stand behind them, but we're in the comfort or that sanctuary of somebody else that we know who is not necessarily judging us, but truly just wanting to hear our ideas, right? But, um, and I wrote it, I ended up writing an article about it and I published it in the, what was the new Maine times in the state of Maine. Um, and the title uh, was something along the lines of, um, you know, uh, front porch politicians. Um, but it's, but it, but it was a play on words, this notion that we're all politicians to a certain extent, or we all have convictions or points of view. Um, but how too few of a time do we actually take what we're talking about on the proverbial front porch and bring it forward in other aspects of our life. So the hat that we're wearing in that moment, is that a hat? Is that a moral conviction? Is that, a, is that something that we so believe in that we're willing to carry that forward in all aspects of our life, back to our day job, mm -hmm. uh, back to the school board, education board, back to our family, you know, back to being a uh, partner uh, to somebody, back to you know, being a, a customer of somebody, you know, at a convenience store, whatever it might be. So we have these ideals, but do we all actually carry forward those ideals in a way that holds us accountable and in a way that um, reinforces that sense of trust in society and in a way that demonstrates human dignity uh, to all parties? And, and I would dare to say no, you know, that was why I, I brought the article forward in a point of view. 
um, but it comes back to that point. We, we, we need to first look ourselves in the mirror um, and take the, the swallow the, the cold hard truth of there are these things that we want to accomplish, but how much are we actually doing in our daily lives to actually do those things? Um, and I will be the first to raise my hand to say I am far from perfect uh, and, and it is a daily uh, activity to recognize, uh, but also um, forgive oneself for knowing that whom we are often is not entirely our design, right? There's lots of things that make us distinct and unique as personalities. There's also lots of things that provide challenge to our lives that we're all working, I believe, um, I'll speak for myself, uh, to become better at, right? But I think validating it, recognizing it, and understanding that tomorrow or today, but also tomorrow represents an opportunity for us to continue to grow uh, and improve is, is, a, is a piece of that arithmetic. Um, but, but the core underlying uh, root cause and opportunity in my belief is, is to your point, Lisa, is um, we have to hold ourselves accountable and no one else is gonna do it for us. And, and we have to, to rise to the occasion in, e in each instance. So we have to stop being front porch politicians and move into a place that we're true leaders and willing to uh, unabashedly apologize for, uh, uh, you know, how we want to, to bring our best selves to the world, um, but deliver. like that. Thanks, Mark. Kim, do you have any other questions? I just thank you very much for coming to the meeting today. Definitely appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So Mark, Kim is from my, it's like that she works where I worked for my 10 years in environmental science. So she's family and she's still there fighting the good fight. I feel like I abandoned it a little bit, but I love seeing her every month. <laughs> You're still fighting. You just changed. Perfection. I know. There you go. There it changed you go. my. Uh, it changed my outfit. <laughs> you know, you're down in the trenches. I kind of uh, moved to a different, different tactic at, at getting to it. So, um, but I still, I miss my coworkers there, and uh, wish I could kind of be there with you. But I'm rooting for you, <laughs> and because I know that. And reading Mark's book, there's a lot of that in there. It's home. Yeah. Mark, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that it, it's nice to be able to see outside of my profession that other people see what's going on as well with the environment and climate change and, and everything. Sometimes when I'm just in my little world of scientists and environmental scientists. We don't always see the perception of folks from the outside, you know, outside of media and that sort of thing. So it was, it was nice to read in the book that other people are very aware of what's going on and they're concerned about it as well. Yeah, yeah, and and thank you. And and whether you're on the front lines on the environment side and, and witnessing habitat, you know, concerns, destruction, um, sometimes restoration, you know, in terms of celebrating things that are, are wins, um, or the front lines as a healthcare worker or educator or anything else. I, I think we begin to, we, sometimes we can't see the entire system for what it's worth because we're so immersed with, with what's right in front of us. Um, but I think as we all know, we are so much part of an interconnected holistic systems world um, and, and where, you know, one small decision somewhere can have a profound impact somewhere else, uh, you know, in, in the ecosystem, broadly speaking. Um, and that's where I think that broader recognition uh, that, that we're all doing, we're all part of the, of that ecosystem. We're all part of the pros and cons associated with it. But ultimately, the small decisions we make somewhere, even this conversation today, you know, is a beacon of opportunity and hope in a world that is needing, you know, to be illuminated with some fresh and new ideas and hopefully, you know, follow on actions and behaviors that, that betters the world. So, Kim, I would say there are, there are so many people that um, appreciate the work that you do, you know, on a daily basis and that there are this broad recognition of humans' behavior on the environment and, and that it has, it's challenged and that 
now is our opportunity to help people um, more than ever before um, because we're seeing the interconnection. We're seeing the connective tissue between human behavior and, and where we need to improve. And um, I think just reinforcing this message and, and bringing people together is a great way for us to, to continue to illuminate the work that you do, but also um, um, curtail the destructive you know, uh, uh, outputs and outcomes of, 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 of that many of us have. Uh, um, and again, I'm, I'm careful, I'll, I'll say this real quick. I thought about this in the first book. Um, it was, it's tough to talk about sustainability and environmentalism, you know, in many different ways because people don't want to be chastised and people don't want to be, look at their own life as part of a negative, uh, connotation on our existence. Right. But I think we also have to validate that. Um, so we, I think we have to understand that it's not completely our fault. Um, but we are part of that solution, right? So we have to understand that while we may only be one consumer, uh, one citizen, uh, we still have the power uh, to influence the world in positive ways. Um, and it shouldn't be something that feels overwhelming because we all need to live and enjoy life and, and find, uh, find greatness in what we do. Um, but we also can, can be a part of that solution, particularly when we realize that um, just what's put out in front of us in terms of the economy and society is not the only way that we need to live and work. Um, and, I, and I actually think the past year has shaken that up for a lot of us in different ways. Um, and that hopefully the blessing or the, uh, the beauty coming out of uh, the, the terrible uh, situation we've all been through uh, is, is that there will be greater opportunities for us to, to do things more smartly, more efficiently, uh, and in ways that are less destructive uh, to ourselves and the environment. So I, I don't want to jump in again with another question. Laura or Nicole, did you have? I was going to ask you if you had any questions. I, I do. <laughs> so um, I think we're a group. I mean, the larger group, we have a lot of thought leaders, leadership and organizations, entrepreneurs, and consultants and coaches in our group. Um, so I think it's a, a strong, when we come together, we have these conversations, but I think we're also a group that consumes, we love to read, we consume, and then we share with people who don't read. And to, uh, we read extreme ownership earlier in the year. And I just put, a, it's perfect for one of my clients. I'm put together like an intro to leadership based on the book. So I know you're doing kind of a lazy promotion of this book. <laughs> Well, can you give us maybe a little bit of a lazy promotion of your other two books? And when, like, if what type of organizations have you used the, that type? Or is it is it all across every organization? Or do you see particular teams that would benefit from reading those other two books around trust and accountability? Yeah. So, so great question, and thank you for that. Um, and with the, and with the current book, I've done in my quote unquote lazy promotion it's been um i'm not sure I, that's true right but yeah no it's okay I, and, and i say that partly because I, I and again this goes to authors uh and consultants we sometimes are our own worst nightmare because we know what we're capable of and then when we're not performing at that standard we can be hard on ourselves right so well cut it out mark yeah i know i i think that's really where my my comment there is coming from because there's only because there's so much that we can be doing and um but that said you know, I've done a hard mailing. Um, you know, I started out with 20. It's probably, you know, near 100 now where, you know, finding specific companies uh, and institutions, organizations, often C-suite where I feel like the book, uh, prior books have been published. Uh, they've had um, accolade. Uh, they've resulted in actually consultative work for me. Mm -hmm. um, that remains a formula that I have found success in. Um, and so, you know, per your question, you know, I see it in both small, medium, as well as large global enterprises. I don't differentiate between them because I see in agile entrepreneurs um, the need to have a certain amount of um, consultative insight and knowledge, you know, on these topics, uh, particularly as they're growing uh, quickly and rapidly and wanting to scale, you know, so how they can um, bring more of a sustainable mindset to the work that they do incorporate the design thinking uh, at the onset often can mitigate impacts and behaviors way down the road. So um, many of them are astute to that, but at the same time, I still see that as an area of, of growth and opportunity. Um, existing small, medium enterprises, they're just, I think, as you guys all know, 
they're limited by resources in so many ways. And so having, you know, um, great uh, resources come to them and, you know, often in teaming relationships, um, you know, is a great opportunity for them. And global enterprises, you know, dare I say, sometimes they can't get out of their own way. You know, the bureaucracy of what they have, um, they have a lot of power, they have a lot of clout, they have a lot of uh, capital to do great things, but, um, and they're and they're starved for time, you know, particularly at, at executive levels. But if you can get to them with the right message at the right time, um, often that can be a, a great opportunity. So I work across the spectrum, you know, in terms of businesses, and but I also engage with applied research and technology organizations. I work with government agencies. I'm working with NGOs and not-for-profits because I have found that from a leadership development and training perspective, these topics, um, at least in my mind and experience, have proven evergreen. Um, there are a lot of advisors, consultants out there doing similar work, um, but often bringing in uh, fresh perspective on that is helpful. Um, the, cha the change agents, to get to the second order of your question, you know, those that are leading change, those that are looking at new opportunities for advancing technology, new, uh, new resources, new processes, um, those that are developing new products, um, those that are on the leading edge of, um, you know, customer relationships or having that dialogue uh, externally, those that are working on trying to solve, you know, new, new challenges for, to the enterprise, um, whether they're evaluating big or small risks and trying to, um, you know, understand how those risks are material to their, their organization, uh, no matter what type of organization it is and then what to do about it and put together a blueprint or roadmap or action plan uh, to mitigate those risks, but also come on the backside of that with, with new value that's created for the enterprise. That's where I see a lot of my work that's been, um, you know, working at that level. So that's been with, you know, chief operating officers, marketing officers, that's been with, you know, change agents or those focused on operational efficiency. It's really been a diverse gamut of um, uh, stakeholders in that way. Thanks. Sorry, my dog started to bark. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were excited. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, yeah, this has been great for me personally. It's so nice to be able to talk to an, an author and kind of see behind the scenes what that feels like. And um, it's very inspirational. So I very much appreciate it. Yes, Thank you very much for being here. We are out of time for our call and uh, Nicole's asking in the chat for your contact information so we can definitely share that with you. <laughs> yeah. um, I think the two of you, uh, I think Mark was interested in connecting with you anyway, so we'll yeah. make that happen. Uh, anybody else watching, you can find him on LinkedIn. And um, if Mark wants us to share any other contact information, we can put it in the description. And Mark, any final words before we end our interview session here with you today? Just thank you all so much for the wonderful questions and the opportunity to, you know, illuminate the book uh, to, you know, with all of you. And thank you for all that you all are doing, you know, on a daily basis. I really appreciated our conversation. I welcome the opportunity to talk with any of you or the broader audience further. Um, and best of luck, you know, um, please consider me a resource. Happy to touch base with anybody anytime. Um, and thank you. Yes, I've thoroughly enjoyed all the conversations I've had with Mark. They always go over time and he never fails to connect me with another person. Um, so always appreciate that, Mark. Likewise. So before we jump off, our next call uh, book is Leading Quietly. And uh, here we go. Joseph Badaracco. Thursday, July 29th will be our discussion. Um, I think this was proffered up by Tanya, maybe? Uh, Lisa, do you know anything? I know we're excited about this book. No, it I does sound like a Tanya pick. So hopefully she won't have another workshop during our, she, she, I met with her this week and she was so mad. She's like, why do I schedule everything during our book club? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm sure it's from Tanya. Send her your accountability slides. I will. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Thank you, Kim and Nicole, for joining us today and always look forward to our next calls. Um, Lisa, am I forgetting anything else? Mm. No, just enjoy the day and thanks again, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks. See everyone thanks, again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.